Hey there, I'm Lee Rowley, and this is Lee After Dark. Why? Because there's more to being a business leader than just business. Each week, one brave entrepreneur ejects the elevator pitch and tells us about, well, whatever they want to talk about. Today, I have with me Jason Picker. Jason, how are you today? Doing greatly. Pleasure to be here. And it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Now, Jason, the rules are simple. Uh, for the next 20 minutes, we can discuss anything you want except for your business. Uh, if you're successful, you'll have five minutes afterward to, uh, to tell us about your business and what you do, how people can get in touch with you. Uh, again, I'm pretty loosey-goosey about the rules, so, you know, just, this, is, this is all for shtick. So, uh, but, uh, so let's go ahead and get ready with this. I'm going to, uh, the 20 minute timer just to keep us on track. And what would you like to get into first? Whatever, whatever you want to go. I mean, my name is Jason. I born in Brooklyn, New York, raised in Brooklyn, New York. And at uh, 18, I took my one year gap year, came to Israel, fell in love with it. And I've been living here since. Oh, excellent. Um, I'm not, honestly not familiar, a one-year gap year. Okay, so it's very common for students to, after high school, before starting college, to come to Israel for a year. So okay. a lot of the Orthodox Jews will come to a yeshiva or a seminary, and okay. a, a number of the irreligious will still come to Israel for other programs in Israel, uh, okay. albeit not as popular. And New York was not a place I was comfortable with even beforehand, and I just fell in love with it. And one year became two years, two years became three years, three years somehow became a fourth year, found somebody to marry, and uh, okay. it went on from there. <coughs> Excuse me, found your home, definitely. Do you, my do home. you travel back to the, to the States? Uh, not as often as I used to, but I, I used to go quite a bit. I did my, my master's. I have a master's in social work that I did at Wurzweiler, which is a division of Yeshiva University. Okay. And they had the perfect program for me because they have a program where you take three summers, June and July, and all you do is your, your schooling, you know, your textbook work. And then in the, that's three summers. And in the, year, in the two years in between those summers, you do your internship wherever you live. So it's catered to wherever you live. We had students from Toronto. We had students from France, Israel, England. And then we all met each other in, you know, back in Washington Heights in New York for June and July. Oh, okay. Wow. Well, but, but these days you don't really get as much of an opportunity to, to come back to the States. No, not as much of an opportunity. Okay. And uh, I haven't been there in the last time I went was, uh, I think, 2016. Okay. You mentioned that, uh, that New York just really wasn't, uh, maybe you didn't dislike, but it really just wasn't, wasn't for you. Was there, was there anything in particular that you could pinpoint or is it just, you know? So I have a few stories that go to it. Okay. Um, obviously, these stories tend to focus more on the, the minority of the people as opposed to the, gen, you know, the general perception of it, okay. as, as these stories tend to go. But what I've learned about myself, and I tell this to other people as well, stop judging other people, judge yourself. Mm-hmm. So rather than judging your community or your surroundings or your friends, say, how, who am I when I'm with this person? A person acts differently when they're in different surroundings. So rather than saying you know, is Joe a good person? Say, who am I when I'm with Joe? And that's how you really get a better feeling for if you saw Joe as somebody you should be with or not. Does, judge bring, does Joe bring out your better qualities? Does, judge, does Joe bring out your worst qualities? Are you comfortable? Are you on edge? Mm. So I always tell people, judge yourself. And that is a way of like a criticism. Oh, don't judge him, judge yourself. No, mm-hmm. if you want to know how somebody else is, who are you with that person? And I was a very different person in New York versus when I was in Israel. And okay. it was more comfortable. Other things as well, I felt less judged, more free to do what I wanted to do, what I was capable of doing. You brought out more of my strengths. And, you know, found a home here. Uh, you asked if there was one story that, that really brought it out to me. Uh, I was walking down a one-way street in New York. And a one-way street in New York, there's only room in Brooklyn. 
there's only room for one lane of cars. So you have cars parked on your left, cars parked on your right, and only one car could go at a time. There's no passing on the right or left or squeezing in unless nobody's parked on the side. Mm. And there was a woman who finally found a parking spot. You can imagine how hard it is in certain areas to find a parking spot. So this woman found a parking spot and she had to parallel park to get to her parking spot. Behind her was a fire engine with its sirens blasting. She made the fire engine wait for her to parallel park before allowing the fire engine to go past her. Mm. That like tore me. And this is, this is, I saw this after I did some time, you know, about a year or a year and a half in Israel. I said, how could you? It just became so self-centered. And obviously, that would be very stereotypical of me of saying she represents all of New York. But she wasn't exclusive in terms of some of the people who I had mentioned, who I had seen and had mm-hmm. grown up with. So, she may not represent all of New York, but she represents enough of New York for it to not be for you. Correct. Which is perfectly fair. And you obviously, you have a life that you that you love now in Israel. So uh, can you tell me a little bit about, you know, like what, what's day-to-day life like for you now? Okay, so believe it or not, it's, it's a lot more, a lot less rushed in, in, in New York. New York, everybody was, was running around, I have to do this next, I have to do this next. And I don't have that. I don't have a car here. I rely on public transportation. I don't need a car. To me, a car would be so much of a hassle. Parking here is just as terrible as New York. But the and but they built it in such a way that buses can go places where cars can't go. And they just instituted a new train system on certain streets. So in some cases the car is almost a detriment to be able to find a way of Hey, I don't need this car. I do a lot more walking, a lot more exercise than I did in New York. A lot more time with my kids than if I was in New York in terms of their schedules and what they're doing, what's expected of them. So it's a lot more free in terms of that stuff. A lot less expectations also in terms of the standards of living and the keeping up with the Joneses. So there's less focus on others and than necessarily what others have and what others are doing. Very uh, much so. That's something that I, I find that's almost epidemic in this here in the States is just we are obsessed with what other people think of us. Yeah. And it it makes for a very hollow life, I think. You know, when you start and, and with the rise of of social media, I mean, it's become more so. We've, you know, children in the United States that are growing up, you know, being conditioned that that your worth is dependent on how many likes you have on your Instagram post, right? You know, it it's it, it scares me to think what direction it's headed, and, and but, for you to talk to me about something very different is, you know, to me refreshing. Go ahead, I'm sorry. But you, you, we started leading towards a point because I, I work with this. Okay. That I speak, my work with children has, has led me to recognize how they think and my, the disconnect that the parents have with their children. And parents didn't have WhatsApp and they didn't have Facebook. And you'll know it on an intellectual level, but they don't understand it on the emotional level. Parents cannot understand what likes mean to a child. Parents cannot understand what being thrown out of a WhatsApp group means to a child. Bullying to a parent ended when the school day ended. Mm. They don't understand the cyberbullying and that it keeps on going and the spoofing of the phones, the spoofing of phone numbers and accounts, and it's just ongoing. And unfortunately... You, you can't be a, it, it's very difficult to be a successful parent if you can't understand what your child is going through. And most of the parents, because of what society has become and as quickly as it's become, 
really don't have a, a good grasp as to what their child is going through. That makes perfect sense. Uh, you know, I, I do remember, and I'm 46, so I remember bullying for me was, he was spending uh, most of my days upside down in a trash can or stuffed in a locker, you know? It's, yeah. it's, uh, it, w it was a very different thing, and uh, it was the sort of thing where eventually, you know, you, you found some way to deal with it, uh, you know, uh, be it be it fighting back or, uh, in, in my case, making jokes because I found out that kept me from getting hit, you know, <laughs> so <laughs> you, know, you do what you have to do. Uh, I, I had a great story once. I, I wrote about this that we used to have, we, we, we left for school at like seven in the morning to go from Brooklyn to Long Island. And we left at about 6 p.m., and you can imagine a bunch of high school boys after being in school the whole day, how much they needed to vent on the bus, on an hour bus on the highway. So they started doing something, guys on the bus started doing something called pile on. Because everybody had their own seat on the bus. It was, you know, number two goes on top of number one, and then three, and then four, and then five. By the time the sixth guy got on top, he put his legs on the roof to push down on the pile. Oh. Yeah. And so one time I started hearing, pile on picker. Yeah, pile on picker. <laughs> So I moved my, my knapsack off and I just wanted to buy time so that I could be on the edge of the seat to fall off. And I go, yay, pylon picker, awesome. And I lay down in the perfect position. So I go, dude, he wants it. We can't do it if he wants it. <laughs> What's wrong? Never again. They never did it to me again. <laughs> just ruined it forever, didn't you? I ruined That's it for great. everybody. That's absolutely phenomenal. Uh, you know, but, but you're right. It's, that's what, that's what I grew up with, you know, understanding as, as bullying. And now it's just so much different and I think more subtle. Right. Uh, go ahead. One thing that I'm, I'm curious about, I'm curious if anybody did a, a research article on this, because this is a theory of mine that in our efforts to be so so good to everybody and politically correct for everybody towards everybody and we, we try to cushion everybody that nobody has the the strength to overcome it because the, the whole theory that that which doesn't kill you makes you stronger so we don't have this we, we haven't built up the resistance from a young age because we try to put everybody in a cocoon from a younger age it's a theory that I have. I'm, I'm curious to know if people have, have written on it and spoken about it. I'm curious about that as well. And I'm definitely going to do some research later this evening on this. So, you know, thank oh, you. For, for do share. Bringing it up. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, it, it's, I've, I've been talking with some other guests and some, some other people in my life about this concept of, of why, you know, why do we, as humans shy so much away from discomfort and, and I mean in discomfort of growth, the discomfort of understanding, the discomfort of challenging your beliefs. We as humans are taught that that's wrong. You shouldn't feel that. And you know, which is why, you know, it, it, here we numb that we numb it with alcohol. We numb it with drugs. We numb it with money. We numb it with possessions. You know, we numb it with television and Netflix binges and, all of these things because as you said, we're just not equipped to be uncomfortable, you know, right. and, and then it goes back to what do you say is building up that resistance and being able to say, you know what, it, it, this stuff doesn't matter because to them it does. Y yes and no. It, it depends okay. on the example that you give. If you're giving general examples of, of your normal, growing pains, shall we say, and the normal things that happen, then, then I will agree with you. Once you start getting to it, and this is why I hate because everybody speaks in extremes now. Every, everything is black and white and, and you're going to say something and I want it to be 100% accurate all across the board. Well, does that, would you say that to somebody who went through heavy trauma? I don't know that I would say that to somebody who went through heavy trauma. Trauma is different. Absolutely. But, but Growing pains are not trauma. People will call it trauma and they'll, they'll throw their hand on the head. Oh, I had such a trauma today. No, you didn't. That's par for the course. You're 14 and that's what happens in high school. You know, that, that's not traumatic. 
Okay. You never know what trauma is. So I, I agree with you on the, the, the general growth that as soon as you step outside your comfort zone, that's where the growth takes place. Mm -hmm. Because you know, think, back to, think back to when you were a baby or pretend that you could think back to when you were a baby. So you've never walked before. You were happy and crawling on all fours. And now dad puts you on, two, on your two legs and backs it away. And mom's standing there waiting for a hug four feet away. So you're extremely uncomfortable. Now slowly you build up the courage and you take those steps. You eventually reach mom who gives you the hug. When you get that hug, your comfort, comfort level is at a thousand percent, but your growth is at zero because you're not taking any more steps. Okay. So yeah, we need to let go, but there are times where the, the, the uncomfortableness is due to trauma and that's a totally different ball game altogether. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I, I appreciate making that distinction. That's, that's very important. Very good. All right. So we have, uh, we've covered that pretty well. What else you got here? We've got about, uh, five minutes left in our, uh, Lee after dark 20 minute challenge. So, yeah. you know, what, what else goes on in, in Jason Picker's life? So what that, else goes on in Jason yes. Picker's life? Trying to parent kids with ADHD. Okay. Okay. And Tell me about that. Well, when you wake up in the morning with a crashing sound because your kid climbed up on the table and pulled down the light fixture and oh, it's goodness. covered in glass. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Now, on the one hand, your kid is on medicine because they have a tremendous lack of impulse control. But your kid didn't get that medicine yet. So how do you discipline a kid who has low impulse control before you gave them the help to get them their impulse control? So plus you have the other issue is what I call, you know, the witnesses, meaning the other siblings, the other siblings need to know that you can't climb on the table and do that. So sometimes you punish not because of that child, but because the other ones need to see that such a thing is not, is not acceptable. That's a, that's a delicate balance. It is very delicate. Welcome to parenting with more than one child. <laughs> <laughs> I can see the perceptions in, you know, maybe not so much you are where you are, or maybe they are, but I they hear there's always kind of that side eye, you know, when, when you see somebody who's dealing with an autistic uh, child or an ADHD child or so anybody who's different, uh, and you know, there's almost like that that sense of judgment, even though they can't co possibly understand what a single day of normal for you is like, or for or for you know a child that's dealing with ADHD. Right. And uh, and I I just have to wonder where we got this sense that we had the right to judge. We try to do what's best for the child mm -hmm. and it is a delicate balance and you're going to get it wrong because it's, it's art. It's not science. That is true. And there've been times where I've apologized to my kids. Um, and th there've been times where I had to have the courage to argue with the doctor and I, and I learned how to argue with the doctor, which is to recognize that I am not a doctor, but how to find a, a different doctor and try to get a competing opinion. And don't be afraid to seek out two or three doctors. Now, once you hit three and they all say the same thing, now that's probably where you should be going. But I had a doctor who was over medicating my child and the kid became like a zombie. And one of the things that they mm. were suffering from was lack of appetite. So he wasn't eating lunch, he wasn't eating dinner. So he was waking, but he was still hungry because he's a kid. Sure. So he was waking up at three in the morning 
going into the freezer and taking the ice cream bars. And he'd have two ice cream bars at three in the morning. <laughs> he'd eat them in the bathroom so he wouldn't get caught. And suddenly we have no ice cream bars for everybody. But I had to realize until I realized that not just was this the, the, low, the lack of the impulse control, but it was the result of him being over medicated and not having the food that he needed. So yeah, I, I do expect my kids to behave to a certain level, even when their medication is not kicked in. And, and it's not acceptable for any of my kids to wake up at that time and, and run into the freezer and, and take our food fridge as well. Um, but I need to also need to recognize that if I'm putting them in that situation, then I can't really, I can't 100% fault them. Fault doesn't need to be a hundred percent, zero percent thing. Juries do this all the time. They'll say, well, 75% of the fault is with the, the driver on the left lane and 25% of the fault is with the driver on the right lane. Sure. And it doesn't need to be a hundred zero people. And I mentioned this before, people think in this all or nothing tech mindset and it is so dangerous. It is so dangerous. And you you mentioned social media does it all the time. And and, oh my God, I hate, I hate the American political scene, but left and right do this equally. Uh, Oh, you think you're perfect. Well, what about this? And, and this one thing, now I could blow you all up. And there are people whose, whose lives are being ruined. Um, did you hear the story about the guy? It's probably in your area. Um, I don't know if it was Ohio State. A guy, put, a guy held up a sign that said, looking for beer money, send me money on Venmo at, at ESPN College game day. He held up this sign. Hmm. And he thought maybe he'd get like 15 bucks out of it. And he got thousands upon thousands of bucks. So much so that he donated it to, I think it was like the Ohio State College for Kids or something like that. One of the colleges for kids in Ohio. Wow. Gave them a nice amount of money. This is within the past few months. Um, and he didn't have to. There was no limit. He could have put it in his own pocket. And then he made Good Morning America. He did all this. And then all of a sudden, one of the local Ohio papers looked through his tweets and noticed he did something stupid at 16. With all due respect, name me, a, name me a boy or girl who didn't do something stupid at 16. Absolutely. And, and all of a sudden now, they're trying to vilify him, and one of the sponsors pulls out. And Are you kidding me? But because we're, we're, we're looking for perfection for, for some reason. And we do such a disservice, and that's why people are so afraid to put themselves out there. People are so afraid... You know, oh no, I'll be caught, imposter syndrome, and all these other things because I, I'm looking all everywhere I'm looking, and the people are demanding perfection. And where they're not demanding perfection, people are giving off this perception that they're perfect. Every influencer is perfect, everyone on social media is perfect, and well, what about me? I'm not. Yeah, it, it brings me down. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And, and we're measuring our worst against other people's best. Yeah, uh, that, that, that's not a recipe for happiness in any way. Yeah. I, it, Ralph, Ralph Kiner, the MLB uh, Hall of Famer, had a great line once. He goes, you're not as good as your best hot streak and you're not as bad as your work slump. I love you it. Can't let, you can't let your peaks define you and you can't let your valleys define you. Very nice. Very nice. And I think that is an absolute uh, proper point for right now because we have successfully completed the 20 minute Lee After Dark challenge, which wasn't Woo-hoo! all that hard, right? Uh, no, yeah. No, I so I, 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 it's been an amazing discussion. I, I, I love just seeing where these things go. And I appreciate your insights. And uh, because I'm a man of my word, uh, I, you've got five minutes if you want to tell us how people get in touch with you, uh, any programs you have available, whatever you want. The floor is yours. Okay. So I go by two names. I go by Jason Picker. And I also go by Yisrael Picker. Since I came to Israel, I also use my Hebrew name. Uh, I have one passport with Jason, one passport with Yisrael. Okay. So I have two separate businesses that I, that I have. I have the website YM Picker. That's YM as in Michael Picker, P as in Peter, I-C-K-E-R.com. 
where I write and I give little videos about child sex abuse prevention. I have videos about parenting and giving parents certain advice and tips. And I try to write articles at least once every two weeks on communication, parenting, child sex abuse prevention, because one thing has led to another in my profession there. But uh, what brought me to Lee was my latest venture in the entrepreneurial area, which I call My Jerusalem Prayer. And people who, the, the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall, depending on what you call it in Jerusalem, it's a place that attracts hundreds of thousands of visitors every year, many of whom come with notes that they write. They write their personal prayers. There's stories of the Pope doing it, uh, Obama, Trump, plenty of others. It's a tradition that goes back hundreds of years. And I just started this project that people who want to send a prayer to the wall, they could go to the website, myjerusalemprayer.com, and you will send your written prayer. And not only will it be delivered, but you will receive a picture of your prayer at the wall or a video of your note being placed inside the wall because there are other organizations that will provide putting the note in the wall for you, but you never get that feeling that it was done. Even though they do it, sometimes you wanna see proof or you wanna show somebody. It's one thing to say to somebody who's sick, oh, I'm praying for you. It's another thing mm -hmm. to show them, look how far it went that you know, your name is now in, in the Western Wall, in the Wailing Wall. And I've done this for a few relatives who simply just asked for prayers. And it really, really blew them away more than they expected it. So we have this service now, My Jerusalem Prayer. It's also available on Facebook and there's an Instagram for My Jerusalem Prayer where we show pictures of this or just general occurrences of what happens at the Wailing Wall. And please like, please follow. And if this is something that interests you, I'm not selling the wall. I'm not selling the concept of you know, why, why you should. But if it's something that, that you value, well, I view myself as no, none other than FedEx here. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not blessing it. I'm not doing any of that stuff. I'm not, I'm not doing, I'm not offering any of that, that stuff that tends to make people uncomfortable. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just a FedEx that will give you a very unique proof of delivery in I the form it. of a picture or a video. Oh, and Lee, that's thank you very much. You have one on the house if you, if you so want one. Oh, well, thank you. I, I may just have to take you up on that. Uh, oh, that, that, that that's fantastic. So uh, one thank last you again. Privacy. Go ahead. Privacy is of key. You're, unless you give permission, it doesn't go on Facebook. Your prayer doesn't go on Facebook. Your prayer doesn't go on Instagram. It's yours. It's sent to you via a link to a private Google Drive or a WhatsApp, whatever you prefer. And it's yours. And we delete it after 14 days. <laughs> Excuse me. Fantastic. Well, thank you. We will make sure we'll have all those uh, links in the show notes too on YouTube when that goes live. Uh, so they'll be able to, to uh, access that information quickly as well. Thank you for sharing that with us. We really appreciate that. Uh, Lee, it's been awesome. Thank you so much. And it, it's almost uh, 1226 in the morning here. Uh, yeah, very sorry. much after dark with Lee. Absolutely. Well, we're out of time. If you found Lee After Dark more entertaining and relevant than most of the drag out there, give our hosts over at ipmnation.com some love or subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, iTunes, wherever the heck else we put this show. This is Lee Rowley with my new friend, Jason Picker. Until next time, be present and be well.